One of the things I hear a lot about using Rust is there's this kind of hesitancy about, you know, well, it's a newer language, even though it's been around since uh, 2010. And uh, maybe people are concerned about, you know, can it be used in the real world? Well, I wanted to, to dispel a few things. First, I'm going to walk you through how to train models with PyTorch and invoke them using GPUs with the Rust PyTorch bindings. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about Firecracker. So what is Firecracker? It is a server-based technology that powers AWS Lambda written by AWS. If, if I could imagine the biggest possible you know, server-based uh, execution environment in the world, it's gonna be on AWS, right? They, they are the 800-pound gorilla of cloud computing. And in fact, one of their most popular services is AWS Lambda. And what is it written in? It's written in Rust. And so I think that should dispel this idea that you can't use Rust in production is really non sequitur. And I'm also gonna show you why, if you're gonna build PyTorch, one of the technologies you should heavily consider is using the same kind of technology that can scale to millions and millions of, of simultaneous requests like AWS Lambda and, and use a technology like Rust. So let's go ahead and dive right in and show how you can use PyTorch with GPU bindings in Rust. Here I'm at the AWS blog post where originally on 2018, Firecracker, a lightweight virtualization for serverless was announced. And you can see here that there's a bunch of really big uh, benefits to it. You can launch a micro VM in 125 milliseconds. It's battle tested, low overhead, open source project, right? When AWS uses it to power a service like Lambda, you know it's a big deal. If I go over to the source code here, we can actually take a look at all of this production source code that's actively being developed inside of the Firecracker micro VM. If I take a look at the actual architectural page here, you can see this is a very sophisticated uh, service that's built in Rust, and this Firecracker scales to thousands of multi-tenant uh, micro VMs on one instance. So it's an extremely efficient way to build a micro VM. Now, this technology is obviously well-suited for inference. And in fact, because we know that PyTorch has bindings uh, to Rust, we can go ahead and use this powerful Rust-based technology. So let's go ahead and go to Rust uh, PyTorch GPU template here. I'm going to go again to my code space. And what I'm going to do is show you how it's very trivial to use PyTorch with GPUs. And so if I go through here and I look at uh, some of the different things I have here, we have a portable PyTorch uh, is something I've been working on. We also have a PyTorch MNIST is another one. And if I go to the README, we can take a look at some of the different projects that uh, I've been playing around with. So let's go ahead and uh, do this. We'll go, to, go through here and we'll go to the README. So we have uh, at the very beginning here an exploration of those bindings. And if I want to do a stress test, this is kind of a fun one to play around with. The first thing I'll do uh, is CD into this directory. And if I just type in cargo run GPU, like that, uh, I can also open up another shell above here. And what I can do is do NVIDIA uh, SMI-L1, and we'll see that in fact, this, uh, this GPU will get saturated in just a second. And that's actually a fun way to really see some of the things that you can do. There we go. We're saturating this GPU by running this uh, Rust code. And if I wanna take a look at the code itself, it's, it's not too bad. Uh, and if we go to this directory, PyTorch GPU, let's go to uh, util, and we look at the source code. Uh, it's a very small function, right? So just a few lines of code, you can actually uh, target the GPU and play around with it, right? And this is really just copying the code that was from the main author. And then if I wanna look at uh, MNIST uh, CLI GPU, we could take a look at that as well. <clears throat> and if I wanna CD into that one, we can go into that and say uh, MNIST CLI GPU. And uh, wh what does this code do? We'll have a library here that says, you know, here's my original code, and then I can pull it into uh, a command and, and execute it. So there's a there's a very small amount of code here to, to get stuff working. I think another example that I think is, is kind of a fun one is this um, uh, 
is the ability to actually train a model. And so let's go ahead and go to PyTorch MNIST. So I'm going to go up here. I'm going to go to PyTorch MNIST. And again, we can take a look at the source code just to see uh, that it's not too bad. And we go to PyTorch MNIST and we look at the source code here. There's several different files here, but the, the main one that's important is the convolutional neural network here. And you can see here that uh, you import those bindings, you set up the structure to play around with a couple different uh, iterations. And then finally, uh, this is the part where I actually build out the neural network. And then I go through here and uh, I run my code. So it's not that much different than looking at Python code here. And if we want to go through and reproduce it, all we need to do is just run this command. And if we go through and we, we train it, it's going to go through and run that uh, run that convolutional neural network training job and then again we should be able to see that the gpu is being targeted while this is actually running there we go we see it's been hit a little bit it should wake up in just a second all right here we go we see this thing's rapidly saturating the gpu got this thing uh cranking and we're able to train this model so it, it's really a, a pretty good uh, tool for people that want to use high performance systems programming languages to train deep learning models. Uh, my experience with the PyTorch bondings for Rust is that they're extremely good. And you can see here that it also has this nice side effect of the packaging is much more simple than Python because it uses cargo, which really makes things very easy to play around with. Whenever you need to install something, you just use the cargo ecosystem and pack package together tools. And finally, the big takeaway as well that's really fun about using uh, PyTorch is you can make reproducible models. And a good example of this, while well, this thing's running, that I'll take a look at is there's something called Sonos uh, Track. This is really an emerging trend here, which is that people, I, I think, are seriously considering how do I actually package together models using portable formats like Onyx and actually put together tools and then give those tools to other people. And I think this is really the future of one version of MLOps is to package your models together and actually distribute them to other people. So I would heavily encourage people to take a look at this. The more people do demos, the more we take a look at these kinds of uh, uh, examples with a system programming language like Rust, I think the MLOps community will deeply benefit from these kinds of command line tools. All right, see you next time.